Good evening. Please open your Bibles with me to James chapter 5. We're going to be reading James chapter 5 verses 7 to 11. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. This is God's word. How's that? There we go. It's a great privilege to open God's Word. Uh, Before we uh, jump in, let's just pray and ask for the Lord's blessing uh, as we open up His Scriptures. Our Father, we come humbly before You, and it has been our great joy to worship You. Uh, This is Your day that You've set aside and... We count it a great joy to have sung to you. Thank you for the words of the songs tonight. Uh, Lord, so rich, drawing our hearts unto you. And we pray that that was a pleasing time, uh, pleasing time to you, Lord, the prayers that were offered, the reading of Scripture. Father, as your word is proclaimed now, Lord, we open up the holy book and you have said that it is living, act, living and active Lord, how dreadful it is if we leave this place not experiencing it as living and active. So please come, cause your spirit to lift the words off the page, and God, may they sink into our hearts. Help us to hear from you. We have come to meet with you, so please come and meet with us. May we be still in your presence. Teach us from your word. May we hear wonderful things and, Lord, open our eyes. If there are scales at the moment, may you remove them as you did with the Apostle Paul. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. We are greatly in need of you. And we pray that you would just be magnified in our midst. And may you be delighted to be in the presence of your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this evening when you walked in... uh, You came in as individuals, some of you came in as couples, but nonetheless you came in as individuals. But in a very real sense, uh, we came in as one, we we came in as a body, as was uh, prayed and said earlier. We come in as one people, and the one people uh, who have a great, great calling. Now, each of us have individual callings that God places upon our lives, but if I was to ask you, what is the calling of the body of Christ? What, what, are we, what is our calling? What are we to be about? What are we to pursue? Now, if I was to throw that out to you, maybe some of the answers that would immediately come from your lips would be, well, we're called to make disciples, and that would be correct. We're called to be holy, right? We're supposed to be a different breed of people. We're called to be a a place where the saints are equipped for ministry when we gather together. That's the purpose of this, for for the teaching of the word and for the saints to be equipped. There's many different things that we are called to, but I wonder if one of the things that you would have offered up as one of our callings is a calling to be patient. Now, when you look at all the other callings, a calling to be holy, to winning disciples, to be training up the saints, they all sound magnificent, and patience kind of seems underwhelming, un- unimpressive, and yet James saves this calling for the pinnacle of his letter. 
as he starts reaching the crescendo to round it off. And so I hope uh, as we walk out of this place tonight that you, will, you and I will embrace this calling of patience in a whole new way and perhaps even with a whole new perspective. Uh, so please, if you have your Bibles open, uh, we're going to be looking at those few verses in James chapter 5. We're jumping in at verse 7. Please keep it open so you can look on with me. Our first point this evening is the call for patience and motivation for patience. The call and motivation for patience. Look at verse 7, just the beginning there. Here it is. Uh, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. So here is the Holy Spirit's calling for us. Patience. Be patient. Now, why is he calling the Christians to be patient, the church to be patient? Well, you'll notice the word there. It says, be patient then, or your translation might say, therefore. So he wants to link us with what he's just said. The patience comes in light of something. So look back to the beginning of chapter 5. Look what's going on. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Patience for the church is needed because of what we just read in those verses. The ungodly rich in this world are mistreating others, especially the church. They are perverting justice with bribes. They are abusing those who are under them and they are fattening themselves at the expense of those who are underneath them. And so the context here of the patience, James is saying is God's people, his believers, are suffering at the hands of the rich and powerful. They're being mistreated and therefore they're called in light of that to be patient. To be patient. And not just any kind of patience. What's interesting here in the original language, it's not just the word patient. It's this really long Greek word, which means long patience or long extended suffering. This is big, big patience he's trying to get at here. In a, in a sense, don't let your patience be short-lived because if it is, it's going to fail. And the word patient or the similar word to patient comes up six times in this little section here. It's the dominant theme. This is what he's calling us to. And Christians are repeatedly commanded in the Scriptures to be patient. For example, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Now, this is patience, and the opposite is retaliation. And patience without retaliation marked Christ. Remember what Peter said of Jesus in his first letter, chapter 2. When they held insults at Christ, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. It marked Christ and it marked the Father. Exodus 34, remember that wonderful passage. The Lord said, Yahweh the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. And this is why it is a fruit of the Spirit. It marks the Son. It marks the Father. And when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, then we start to demonstrate love, joy, peace, and patience. Patience of God. We're called to be patient like the God who is patient towards sinners. Now, unfortunately, Retaliation comes much easier to us than patience, even to the very best of God's people. You remember in Acts 23 when Paul is arrested and he's before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, and Paul says to them, I am innocent before God. And the high priest tells one of the nearby standers to strike Paul in the mouth. Punches Paul in the mouth and Paul speaks up and says to the high priest, God will strike you, your whitewashed tomb. 
And then the people are shocked and they say, how, how dare you speak to the high priest like that? And Paul apologizes for his retaliation. How few, how few possess the holy character of patience? Why is it seemingly harder for our generation to be patient than any other generation that's gone before us? Well, we are the instant generation. We have the quickest internet speeds. You don't have to go to Video Easy anymore to watch a movie. You don't have to go to Sanity to hear the latest music. Our food is fast food, whether on the go or at home. We've got the microwave. Everything is instant, instant access to anything on our smartphones. If you want to do a little bit of research, pull out your phone. If you want to check the news, pull out your phone. If you want to hear the weather, if you want to get a GPS, whatever it is that you need, even if you want to do shopping, just pull out your phone. Everything is instant. And that's why we have found waiting in queues for PCR testing so infuriating for hours because everything is instant. But that hasn't been. But Christians need patience not just for minuscule things like queues. No, no, for much more. James chapter 1 started with our need for patience. When you endure various kind of trials, hardships, and suffering, we need it because we experience long-standing pain, as was said in the sermon this morning, because we are frequent experiences of heartache, because you and I have so many unanswered prayers, because there's so many letdowns, and often it's God's will for us to carry crosses and often a thorn in the flesh. And even sometimes to experience the dreadful Judas kiss of betrayal. These early Christians, they knew suffering. But look how James motivates them to long patience. Look at verse 7 again. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. And there it is. The difficult task of patience is going to be short-lived. James says the patience that you need has an end point. It's not going to be forever. He says until the Lord comes. There, that word until, the imagery is pregnant kind of language. A pregnant, expecting mother. She must endure all the discomforts and pain of pregnancy until delivery. The pain and the discomfort doesn't go forever. It's only for nine months. And this is the momentary language that James uses here when he says, be patient until, until the Lord comes. So in your trials, in your troubles, be patient as you wait for the Lord to appear on the clouds to come and take you home. The beautiful song that we sung before, we will see him in the air. And when he does come, when he does appear in the sky, he's coming with healing in his wings. The scriptures say, and all sorrow will be turned to joy and the former things will be forgotten because all things will be made new until that day. And what is interesting, we, like James's readers, like the church 2,000 years ago, we live in between the two comings of Christ. We are post-cross, pre-coming Christians. We live in that period. And the New Testament has so much to say about the second coming. When Jesus comes, just before he comes, it says there's going to be great uh, signs and wonders on the earth. There's going to be great trials under the Antichrist. Christ is going to come back with all the Christians who've already died, and we're going to meet him in the air. Unbelievers are going to see the lamb in the sky, and it says they're going to be hiding under mountains in terror and fear. And when he comes back, there's going to be a great separating between the sheep and the goats. And when we see him, as we sang, we are going to be transformed into his likeness in an instant. James mentions the second coming, and he skims over all of those details. All of them. But look what he does add. Look at verse 8. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is Near. So how does he further motivate them to patience in light of the second coming? Not only in verse 7 is the Lord's coming a reality, but he says in verse 8, the Lord's coming is near. 
It's close at hand. It's approaching, he says here. And the nearness of Jesus' return is the repeated emphasis of the New Testament. It is near. It's close. It's at hand. But the problem is 2,000 years have passed since we were told that it was near. And so this leaves many biblical scholars and commentators to conclude that Jesus, who said he doesn't know the hour nor the day when he's coming back, that Jesus and the apostles got it wrong. Yes, he's coming back, but they thought he was coming back soon, but they were mistaken. Even the early church longed for this coming, but struggled with its seeming delay. So that's why when you read Peter's second letter, he, just, he, he knows he needs to give them a reminder of God's time frame and our time frame. And what does Peter say in chapter 2, verse 3? Beloved, do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Confusing, hey? It was just a few months ago that we thought maybe it's a good, good time now with the two, our two eldest children to, to show them the first Narnia film. And they were excited, and we watched it. And you know the story? The kids, they're very young, and they cross over into the water through the wardrobe, and they go into Narnia. And then as everything happens, meet Aslan and all of that, at the end there, there's that great battle, the great war. And the war is won because of Aslan. And then it finishes, that, that battle finishes with the four kids made kings and queens of Narnia. And there's a great celebration of their coronation. Now, then there's a fast forward, and you see the four children running through the forest, but they're adults now. They're much older. They're grown-ups. And as they're running through the forest and they're playing and laughing, they stumble across the wardrobe again. And as they go back into the wardrobe and they cross back over inside to where they used to live, they cross over and as the camera changes, the four of them are no longer adults, but they're children again. Barely a fraction of time has passed from when they went into Narnia. Decade, more than a decade went past in Narnia but barely any time went past where they were living. And as we watched that scene, the kids were, our two oldest kids, they were so confused, they couldn't understand how that worked because they were just growing up, they'd been in Narnia so long, and now everything was the same. How much more confusing with us when we're talking about the God who lives outside of time, who created time. Peter says, for him, a day is like a thousand years but still in light of that, the New Testament emphasizes the nearness of the second coming. And therefore, it's unbiblical and it's unfaithful for Christians or pastors or preachers to talk about the second coming as if it might be far away. Because that's not how the New Testament talks about it. It's always talked about near. And James actually motivates us with the nearness of the second coming, not the distance of the second coming. So there's the motivation for patience. Secondly, tonight, we see examples of patience. Now, we're given three examples of long patience in this passage. The first example is from the workforce. The second is from ministry. And the third is from the trials of life. Now, there are many jobs that require patience, much patience. If you're a fisherman, you might be waiting on the water all day for a catch, like Peter and the disciples were, remember when they couldn't catch anything, great patience. If you're a captain of, captain of a boat back in the first century, you needed great patience because the, end, the, the boats didn't have engines and you were dependent on the wind. Also, if you were a garment maker, great patience to bring about the finished product with needle and thread. But James leads us to the profession that requires more patience than any other job. Look at verse 7. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its, yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. Those who are called to extraordinary patience and waiting are farmers. Now he says here they wait, and this is in ancient Israel, they wait for the autumn and spring rains or the early and late rains. Now the farmers would be hopeful they would be hopeful that in autumn they would at least get some light rain. So this would be uh, September, October for them. And the light rains would just soften up the ground enough so that they could sow the seed and that the germination process could begin. 
but then they would be absolutely dependent upon the spring rains, which would be March and April. And that would be the downpour which would bring about the great crop. Now, what kind of crop were the farmers waiting for? What does James say? What kind of crop was it? They wait for it to yield its valuable crop. Literally there in the Greek, its precious crop. Why is it precious? Well, you remember back in 2017, 2018, when we weren't able to wash our cars because of the drought. Farmers were absolutely crippled in Australia because of it. I I came across an article from Courier Mail and said this quote, The dry winter has most Queensland farmers desperately waiting for rain. There are about 400 dairy farmers left in Queensland and many would be praying for rain. Then another article said this in the same vein, quote, The long dry spell is making many Western Australian farmers nervous. Many are reading over long-ranging weather forecasts and continually looking towards the heavens in the hope that the clear, bright blue skies will be replaced by black clouds. Unquote. See, the farmers wait and wait for the Lord to open the heavens and let the showers come down. They're so patient. When we wait for things, it's not like when we're waiting for a parcel to come in the mail that we're really excited about. This is nothing like that. James says they wait for the precious crop. Why is it precious? Because they need rain for the animals. They need rain for the crops. They need the crops for income. They need the crops for survival. Their lives depend upon this. Friends, what makes the farmer such a fitting example and illustration for the Christian? It's not just that their calling is difficult. It's not just that they're called to wait. But when you go deeper, you see that there's a part of their job that they are absolutely powerless in to bring about the desired outcome. Experience, cleverness, and skills will not bring about the reins. They will not. They're absolutely dependent. And so farmers need to wait for God's provisions and and they need to wait prayerfully. And James says it's the same for the Christians. Farmers need to wait for the rains. And Christian, you need to wait for the Lord. You have to wait for Him to come. He's coming. Look at this second example James gives, verse 10. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Example of long patience through troubles are the prophets, James says here. The calling of a prophet was a calling to walk a path of sorrow, of sorrow. Think about Isaiah. After he has a great encounter with the Lord, he sees the Lord. And then God says, who's going to be my servant? Who's going to be my servant? And Isaiah says, me, I will. Here I am. And then God says, okay, you're the man, but guess what? You're going to preach, and they're not going to listen to you. You're going to preach, and they're not going to understand. I'm going to close their eyes. You're not going to get any, any success. Now, can you imagine that kind of calling? How patient would you have to be to endure such a ministry as that? Or then take, for example, Elijah who spoke the word of the Lord, that great miracle of fire from heaven. And then once he does it, King Ahab and Jezebel want to kill him. And then Elijah says, God, please take my life. And God says, no, because I have more work for you. I know your life is in threat. I know you are afraid, but you need to be patient. Take Hosea, the prophet, the holy man called to marry a prostitute. He marries her, that evil woman. And then she goes and cheats on him. And then God says, Hosea, go take her back. Because that's how patient I am with my people. You go and do the same. And then you have Jeremiah, who was so faithful. He loved the people so much. He cried over them. He's called the weeping prophet. You read it, Lamentations. It's just a man crying over the people to come back to God. And what do they do? They hunt him down. They throw him down a cistern. They leave him for dead. And yet he has to patiently endure under the calling of the Lord. And James says, take 
the prophets. And why did they suffer? Why does James say they suffer? It wasn't because of their personalities. It wasn't because of their sin. What does James say? As those who spoke in the name of the Lord. They suffered because they were faithful. Being the spokesperson of God, there was no greater calling. There was no higher calling than that. And yet there were none so mistreated as the prophets. None. None like them. And James tells us, go and read the prophets. He's telling the Christians, go and read the prophets. Go and look at them, endure patiently. And he says to us as Christians, if the prophets had to patiently wait through the storms, then you all patiently wait for the Lord to come back and calm the storm. Just wait. Look at the third example he gives in verse 11. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The scriptures, the Bible is full of people not to imitate. Remember Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Don't imitate her. She loved the world. She was killed. And then Hebrews says, remember Esau. After he sinned, he wanted the blessing back even to the point of tears. And it said repentance was too late for him. And and the writer of Hebrews says, be careful. It might be too late for you. But the Bible's also full of people to imitate. What did Paul say? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. We do have examples to imitate. James selects us Job. He says, that's who you need to imitate. Job suffered so greatly God allowed Satan to take his animals, take his children, and even take his health. God took it all away from him, and and Job had to endure through all of it. But what's interesting, when you read the book of Job, patience wasn't one of Job's strongest traits, was it? Remember Job? He cursed cursed the day he was born. And remember when he gets fed up with his friends saying, your your advice is just long-winded and it's hot air when he lost his patience? But Job's steadfast, patient faith is what shines through that letter. Remember in chapter 13 when he says those wonderful words, Though you slay me, yet I will trust him. His patient faith. You see, it would seem that God is a cruel, careless, distant God. And what does James say? Far from the truth. What does he say at the end of verse 11? The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You know what's so interesting about that verse? James invents a word. He invents a word in the Greek. Comes up with his own word for compassion, mercy. Creates a word here. He puts two words together to mean this word full compassion. Compassion is not enough for God. Full compassion. Not only does God restore Job, but God brings Job closer to him. That was the point of it. He doesn't get his children back, but he gets closer to God. Remember what Job says at the end of it. I heard of you before, but now I have seen you. What's Job saying? I used to know you. Now I know you so much more through this trial. That's the point of Job. Not that he gets everything back. It says God is full of compassion and mercy. Again, this word here, it's strongly affectionate language. Literally, it's like the mother's love for their child, like a mother who comes running to their child's rescue. And James is saying, the Lord is on his way. Children, he's coming to your rescue. He's on the way. He's compassionate and he's full of mercy to you. And so here, James, by the Holy Spirit, says, like the farmer has to patiently wait for the rain. Like the, like the prophets had to patiently suffer. And like Job had to endure trials. You too patiently wait for the Lord. Patiently wait for Him. So we've seen motivation for patience. We've seen examples of patience. Now we come to cultivating patience. Cultivating patience. Look, in verse 8, James wants to draw our attention back to the farmer. The farmer cannot bring about the rains, but... Even though he can't do that, the farmer does not wait passively for the rains. He keeps a watchful eye over them. He watches over the land, the seed, and all the work that he's done. He guards and manages it. Why? Why does a farmer not still, stay still while he waits? Because he wants to make sure everything is ready for the rain. 
Everything must be ready for the rain. And the point is, we must make sure that we are ready for the coming of the Lord. We must guard. We must watch. We must wait. We must be prepared for his arrival. So what does James instruct us to do? What does he tell us? Now, unfortunately, the NIV here, out of all the translations, misses and summarizes what it says here. And when I read it in the NIV, I completely missed it until I went to the other translations. Look at verse 8, and I'll show you what I mean. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, the NIV says be patient and stand firm. That's just a, a real paraphrase. What it literally says is be patient and establish your hearts. Or be patient and strengthen your hearts. So if you want to write in your Bible, you have permission. Strengthen and establish your hearts. This strengthening and establishing, this is the same language used of Jesus when it says, he set his face like flint to Jerusalem. He was ready and committed and nothing was going to deter him. And, and James says, do that with your hearts. Strengthen them. Now, while we wait, we need to establish our hearts. The farmer gets the land ready and we need to get our hearts ready, he's saying here. Now, this seems to be like a contradiction in the scriptures. James says, you need to strengthen your hearts. But then when you read Paul, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3, may the Lord strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes. Do you see the difference here? James says, strengthen your heart so you'll be ready for the Lord's coming. Paul says, may God strengthen your heart so you'll be ready for the Lord's coming. So which one is it? Who's doing it? God or us? Well... When it comes to salvation, our salvation is all of God. The new birth, it's supernatural. Our repentance, our faith, it's given from God. You don't do that. You don't work that. It's given to you. God chooses to do that in a person's life. But our Christian walk is God working in and through us. It's us working with God, working out our salvation that he's given to us. How does God work in and through us? What does he do? He drives us to the scriptures for us to read it, to listen to it preached, to think about the scriptures so that we get the eternal perspective, so that we get renewed in our minds. How does he work in and through us? Through dependent prayer, where we have communion with God, where we wait upon the Lord so that our strength is renewed like the youth. And he works in and through us by fellowship with believers. That's why we come to church. Fellowship with believers. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Let me quote John Blanchard here. He says this, It is certainly probable that there are about 300 references of the second coming in the New Testament, one for every 13 verses from Matthew to Revelation. So if you take all the passages on the second coming, there's one for every 13 verses in your New Testament. God wants his people to be thinking about the second coming, to be living in light of the second coming, to be prepared to live holy, undistracted lives, to live ready lives, unashamed at his appearing. And so this is a call to strengthen our hearts as we wait patiently. Now this leaves us to our final point tonight. Our final point, the bitter consequences of impatience. The bitter consequences of impatience. Look at verse 9. Don't grumble, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. They begin to grumble, it says here. Grumble they were. This refers to frustration, but frustration spilling over. You remember Israel in the wilderness when they came out and things got a bit difficult. They went through a hard season, and what did they do? They started grumbling against Moses. They started saying, we wish things were like they used to be. They were grumbling. A complaining in the church community has manifested, and James, by the Holy Spirit, he's aware of it. He's aware of the grumbling. What's going on? What's going in here? What's this talk about grumbling? Remember the context. Christians are going through hardships. They're being persecuted by the rich and powerful unbelievers. And yet they're called to patiently endure all of it. And yet they start grumbling. But here's the interesting part. They don't start grumbling against their enemies who are hurting them. What does James say? 
they start grumbling against each other, against one another. Now, why on earth should they start grumbling against the family, against the church? What's going on here? Friends, how easily do we allow work frustrations to be taken out on our family? We've all known that. How easily do we allow our fears and our anxieties become an opportunity to take a shot at someone else? Even if it has nothing to do with them. What about the stress of COVID and restrictions and differing political views? I remember talking to someone and they were telling me they had a friendship with another couple and family for decades. Decades they've had this friendship. And over everything that's happened now, they're no longer talking. And the other couple said, you're not coming to our house anymore to play with our kids. Family members no longer meeting together or talking. Turning against each other. And James sees this happening to the early church. Happening to the early church. And it's extremely sad because you have brother against brother, believer against believer. Right here. The New Testament says in Ephesians 4, 2, bear with one another in love. So despite your differences, despite your opinions, despite what your preferences are, bear one an- with one another in love. And yet what do we read in verse 9? They're grumbling against each other. They're complaining with one each- against one another. See, when we become overwhelmed by our circumstances and, wh- and what our situation is, then we become distracted from patiently waiting for the Lord to return And when we forget about the Lord's return, we start bickering and grumbling and complaining. And the impatience, how does it manifest? It manifests in grumbling against each other. Our tongues become the release valve of a disgruntled heart. That's what our tongues do. Now, James has already, this is why the letter as a whole is so important, James has already talked about the destructive power of the tongue, hasn't he? Remember chapter 3, what do you say in verse 8? The tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Verse 6, the tongue is a fire and can set a whole forest ablaze. Now here's the shocking thing. He gets to chapter 5 and he says this. You know how a tongue can set a whole forest ablaze? Do you want to know what forest is on fire? The church community. The church community. It's on fire. And what caused the fire? Grumbling tongues grumbling against each other. Do you see how James ties in the whole passage here? It's not just random verses. He's tying the whole thing in here. Christians facing hardships in the world. It's a difficult world to live in. And then you've got a Lord's return who seems forever delayed, supposed to be soon, but he's not coming back. And then what's the inevitable result? When you have hard circumstances and the Lord delaying his return, it's a recipe for great stress upon the family of God. It just is. It just is. Let me quote Alec Maria. He was really pointed on this. Let me quote him. Listen carefully. I only read it once. Quote, Pressed from, a, from outside by opponents, waiting for a Lord who is coming yet seems not to come, how easily tempers can fray and the fellowship begin to fall apart. How easy to begin to take it out on each other, to find cause for complaint within the family. The tongue which destroys peace blights the harvest. The harvest of righteousness can grow only in the soil of peaceful fellowship. End quote. James here is a pastor and he sees the church family on fire, but he wants to seek their renewal. How does he do it? How does James the pastor do it? Did you catch it in verse 9? Don't grumble against each other, brothers, He reminds them of their true identity. He calls them, in the midst of their fighting against each other, he calls them brothers, brothers and sisters. He's saying to them, guys, you're family. You are family. Remember, before you were saved, you used to be strangers. You didn't used to know each other. You you were different ages, from different social classes, from different areas, and you weren't even acquaintances. But what happened? The gospel came to you, and God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, He gave you new life. Jesus washed you, and He made you His family. You came in as individuals, but He made you one. 
You're one. You're family, brothers. Don't grumble against each other. What are you doing? Jesus washed you of those sins. He washed you. Why are you doing this? Brothers, let it not be so. He reminds him of their identity. How else does he seek their renewal? He has another tool in the shed. He does it by the fear of the Lord. By the fear of the Lord. Look again at verse 9. Don't, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. The church was in danger of coming judgment, of God's coming judgment. Now think about it. Judgment for simply grumbling against each other? God's judgment for that? Absolutely. James says, absolutely. Do you remember when I mentioned Israel before about grumbling, where they were complaining, grumbling against Moses and how life used to be? What did God do? He made sure that whole generation that left Egypt died in the wilderness. He judged them, and they were not allowed to enter the promised land. Does God take grumbling in the family seriously? Absolutely. Absolutely And look how he intensifies the warning. At the end of verse 9, he says, And the judge is standing at the door. Do not miss the language of the second coming. The Lord's coming is a reality. The Lord's coming is near. But the Lord who is coming is also the judge who's standing at the door. Friends, you don't get any closer than that. If you text someone who's coming over and say, Hey, whereabouts are you? We're waiting for you. You get a message that comes back and says, I'm outside the door. You don't get any closer than that. And James says, the judge is standing at the door. He's very close. And he's so close, he can hear everything that's said in the house. Because he's standing at the door. Brothers, don't grumble against each other. CHBC, the early church struggled in hardships. They had very, very difficult circumstances to live through. And they faced hardships. And they got distracted from the Lord's coming. And James reminds them of that. And says, you're distracted and now you're grumbling against each other. Be careful. CHBC, by God's grace, we face hard circumstances in the world and in the church. Let us not get distracted from the Lord's coming and that we're a family. Let us not lose sight of that. Let us not be given to grumbling against each other, hurting each other with our words. Let us not do that because our great calling that we see is not just to make disciples, not just to to train up people for ministry, but our great calling as a church is to be patient. Patient for our Lord's coming. Let me close with an illustration here. Let's just say we go back in a time time machine and you were able to walk into Vincent Van Gogh's art studio, his personal studio, and you walk in into the studio and you see Van Gogh and he's painting away. He's just started something. And as you look at him paint away, you look over his shoulder and you start looking at the canvas and you look at his artwork and you cannot make heads or tails of it. It just looks like a mess. There's strokes everywhere. There's brush strokes. It actually looks like chaos on a canvas. And Van Gogh stops painting and he looks over you and he knows what you're thinking. And he says, don't worry about it. I'll come to you when I'm finished. And when I come, I'll show you the finished product, and then you'll see. And so you leave and walk out. And before you know it, he's knocking on your door. And he comes in, and he shows you the painting. And you are in absolute awe. You're amazed. You are stunned at the beauty of this thing. You're not just in awe, though. You're ashamed. Because you questioned him. Church, we don't understand what the Lord's doing. We don't know what he's doing in this world. We don't know what he's doing in our midst. But when he comes back, when the Lord comes back, all the questions will be answered. And all the pieces of his puzzle will come together. And he will show us the magnificence of the work that he had in each person's life. And he'll say, look, and we will stand in absolute awe. We will be amazed But the question is, will we be ashamed? Because we didn't wait patiently while he was working. The church is called to patiently wait for the Lord. Let me pray.
Father, we thank you for your word. It is wonderful. But it's not just a good book. It's life-giving and it speaks. Lord, 2,000 years ago, James wrote these words. And yet we see them so relevant to us, so needful, Lord, in our lives. We thank you for your word. It's clear as crystal when the Holy Spirit is working and illuminating. Father, I pray in all of our endeavors as we seek to be missional, as we seek to make disciples, as we seek to train up people for the ministry, I pray that you would help us to be a church that patiently waits for the Lord Jesus, patiently endures, patiently waits for you. Help us to be prepared, not idle, but diligent. Help us not to grumble against each other. Help us to bear with each other in love and, and so be the people that you desire us to be. Lord, we pray these things. We are unable of our own strength, but with you all things are possible. And so we commit ourselves as a church unto you. And Lord, other churches who are doing it greatly difficult through the trials that have come upon this world at this time, may you be gracious to them as well. Strengthen your people and bind us in the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing to our Lord.